My story actually started in Ukraine. My parents were born in uh, little villages in Western Ukraine and lived under Hitler and Stalin during the years up to and including the Second World War. So it, it doesn't get any worse than that. They lived in displaced persons camps for four years after the war until they were allowed to legally emigrate. And I was conceived in one of those camps, but then birthed on U.S. soil. So they came to Ellis Island. They were resettled in a small town in rural Wisconsin. That's where I grew up. This is Emily Harmon, host of the Onward Podcast. And I want to give a heads up to my Onward Podcast listeners. Number one, I appreciate you. Thank you very much for listening to the Onward Podcast. And number two, I wanted to let you know that starting in January of 2022, I started to call my live show Onward Live, and I changed the theme. It's about creating a life you love living now. I'm going to publish the Onward Live episodes under the Onward Podcast brand. So this is part of the transition. This episode was recorded back in the fall of 2021. And I have a few more episodes like this to publish. They were recorded live as the Onward podcast. Pretty soon, though, we will transition to all Onward live episodes being broadcast under the Onward podcast brand. No worries. I'm still going to bring you awesome guests and awesome interviews. Conducting these interviews is one of my most favorite things to do. I learn from every single guest, and I hope you do, too. Let's cut to the interview. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Onward podcast. I'm really excited to interview Martin. We were just chatting a little bit before the show, and I'm going to bring him on. One of the things I wanted to say, though, is he's in San Francisco. Sometimes they have power outages and stuff because of the fire, and I'm in Virginia. We're having like a thunderstorm, and it's raining, and some lightning. So I have no idea if we're going to lose power or not. So if we do, we we decided up front, if we lose power and we like get cut off, we're going to just reschedule this. We're not going to sit there and be stressed about, you know, how do we reach each other? How, how long are we going to be offline? So we'll just be back another time. So just wanted to let you know that. So let me bring um, my guest Martin in to the room in just a second. He is a first generation Ukrainian born American. And he's a former San Francisco real estate power broker and an author. And we're here to talk about the pursuit of the American dream at all costs. So you know that the Onward podcast is all about facing adversity, moving forward, and discovering ourselves along the way. And this is Martin is a perfect guest to talk about that with us. So welcome, Martin. Hi, Emily, and thanks so much for having me on. Oh, I'm I'm so excited to talk with you. I love talking with all of my guests. I just, uh, when I used to work for the Navy, I felt like I didn't, I retired a couple of years ago. I felt like I didn't really have time to have conversations with people and to really like get in depth and to get to know them and to get to understand, you know, their story. And so that's one of the main reasons I love doing this Onward podcast is just hearing the stories of of so many different people. And I know that you're gonna kick it off with telling us about your story, your backstory. Yeah, my my story actually started in Ukraine. My parents were born in uh, little villages in Western Ukraine and lived under Hitler and Stalin during the years up to and including the Second World War. So it doesn't get any worse than that. They lived in displaced persons camps for four years after the war until they were allowed to legally emigrate. And I was conceived in one of those camps, but then birthed on U.S. soil. So they came to Ellis Island. They were resettled in a small town in rural Wisconsin. That's where I grew up. I was fortunate in that there was a Jesuit boarding high school on the perimeter of town that admitted students from other states and even other countries. And that's where I learned how to think, how to write, and was was learned a lot more than I did in college or intellectually later in life. After college, I moved to California 
and lived in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, in Oakland and um, married and had a real job. I was a city planner and I was dead broke and I hated what I did. And I also had two stepchildren and a family to take care of. And one day I was at the zoning car counter processing permits and a prosperous developer came in and started yelling at me. <laughs> and I just said, this is, this is a crazy way to live. I was almost 30 years old. Yeah. And, uh, I just quit. And I think a lot of people can relate to that because that's what's happening in some ways now in the U.S. People are getting frustrated with their job and and they're leaving. So, OK, so you just quit. That's kind of scary to me. You yeah, didn't have my, to my wife didn't think too, too much of it. <laughs> yeah. And so but I, I, I channeled a mentor I had 10 years earlier after high school, I uh, moved uh, to Chicago and got a job during the summer selling household products door to door mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to make some money for school in the fall. And I worked for a fuller brush company. Probably a lot of your listeners don't even know what that is. I've heard of them, the, the fuller brush salesman. Yeah. Go door to door, right? Yeah. There, there were some famous people that were fuller brush salesmen, particularly Billy Graham who was one of the top salesmen in South Carolina. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and what I learned about sales and later in life, that's fundamentally what I did. I learned that, that the fundamentals are the same. It's just whether you're selling hairbrushes or high rise office buildings, it's okay. a difference in degree, but not in kind. So, so anyway, I channeled, channeled my mentor and I said, I, I know I can sell. And I looked around and I, I didn't have a real passion for much of anything. It was driven by necessity. I was broke and I wasn't going to get stuck in an, another dead end job. And I didn't like working for people. So I looked around and thought that the commercial real estate represented the highest value assets and therefore must be really big commissions. <laughs> yeah, more than more of a commission than a than a hairbrush. So I got my <laughs> my license and got into investment sales, which is the probably the risk kind of subgenre of the commercial real estate field. As a broker, you work entirely on commissions, so you don't get paid until the deal closes. And these large transactions then took months, and maybe never closed. So you, I had to figure out how I was going to support the family in, in the meantime. And I started accumulating credit cards and would draw one down, get another one, pay it off. So I think I had probably 12 to 15 and the banks weren't going to uh, give me any more. And fortunately, about a year after I started, I got my first commission check and the rest is history. So, <laughs> so I, I became a, a broker and quickly moved in professionally from Oakland, selling small deals to San Francisco, where, you know, this was the financial center of the West Coast and where all the big deals got done. And along the way, my wife and I, we divorced, but we had joint custody of my daughter. And she stayed with me uh, every weekend. And during the week, we do homework on the phone. Mm -hmm. And we may remain very close to this day. And then I remarried and my second wife, it wasn't until after we got to know each other for some time that I found out she had a, what I call special powers in the world of the unseen. She was a black woman from rural um, Alabama. And like myself, after high school, got on the bus and moved to California and never looked back. It was a little different then. You didn't have handheld gadgets to communicate with all your friends along the way. And it's just, uh, you make that decision. So she became my, not only my wife and lover, but a spiritual mentor and moral compass. And as I progressed up the ladder in the brokerage world, I fell more and more in the clutches of my alcohol addiction. 
And I started drinking. And when I lived in this little town, there was about 5,000 people and 40 taverns. So almost every adult male was an alcoholic. (laughs) And I just thought that's the way it was. And so uh, one day my wife just said, you're either going to deal with this or I'm gone. And so I did. And I kind of did it on a self-directed basis. And then now it's around the year 2000 and I'm at the top of my game. And I quit brokerage just kind of from out of the blue and for a variety of reasons and tried my hand uh, at other things, day trading among them and discovered I wasn't very good at that. And then got a call one day from a colleague and to make a long story short, got into the business of being a real estate operator, which is investing your own money and primarily the money of major financial institutions, buy properties and hold them and manage them and, you know, then resell them. At this, at this point, my, I, got, I got probably the biggest uh, shock of my life when one night my wife dropped dead. And so the rug was just pulled out from under me. And there's no way to describe how that feels. And it was with the passing of time and a lot of work and, and connecting with a psychic medium who I had known for many years to find out that love can overcome physical death. And then I got back to work and sort of my third reinvention was as a real estate developer. And I had a partner and we had a major project in downtown San Francisco, a $400 million mixed use development. And this was right at the time of the financial crisis and great recession. So I'm not going to give a spoiler on this. You're going to have to read the book to find out what happened. But then about eight years ago, I got out of the game and began to write and then eventually wrote my memoir, The Other Side of Success, Money and Meaning in the Golden State, which took me about three years and then published it. And that brings me to the present day. Let me ask, I wonder, like, I lost power where you you were still on and you were still talking, right? Yeah, you disappeared, but I... You were able to keep going. Yes. I think it worked. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's awesome. Because, I mean, I we just had this loudest thunderclap I have ever heard. And <laughs> the power just went out. And my dog ran in here and is like all scared. And so, okay. So we can continue. Oh, that's great. Because I'm so glad that you were able to keep going. Okay. So I missed some of it. I... I missed when you were, you were talking just a little bit about how you had joint custody of your daughter, but I don't make you repeat it all since you covered it. Yeah. So my, my life was a roller coaster and there was highs and lows and not just in business, but in my personal life where I had to deal with things with, with high stakes overcoming great loss and dealing with grief and addiction and with people closest to me, like uh, my sister, who became estranged from the family. Mm. Uh, And after 30 years, we reconnected. It's a a great story, but she uh, she was suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. And I had to relearn all my thinking about mental illness. Yeah. Uh, so there's, it's, it's just uh, life is one thing after another. It sure is. So we've got some people here. Deborah says, Martin, you are resilient. Yes, he is, Deborah. He is. And Kate, Katie says, we lost you, but Martin was still able to keep talking. So that's awesome. <laughs> I'm glad. Great. And, and Katie says, Martin, great meeting you. And thank you for sharing your life story. Yeah. What did your parents do when they came over from um, Ukraine? For a living. Well, they had two suitcases and my older sister, who was two years old at the time. The the times were different and the whole discussion around the immigrant experience. They they dodged that almost every day during the war years. And so when they came here, 
their mindset was that the worst possible situation they could find in America was infinitely better than the best of times they left behind. That's just the way it was. So they were, they were when they first came, they were taken advantage of. And I really didn't speak English well till I started grade school. But it wasn't like, oh, you know, poor us. It's like, God. <laughs> we're thankful. What a little family we had left back back in Ukraine, you know, pity them. It's just so. How did what your parents went through went through and what you went through you know moving over i know you were young but how did what they went through and how they raised you impact you and your decisions as an adult well i think common to almost any immigrant family is the first priority is that the child will do better than the parent and a big component of that is getting an education mm -hmm. so that was just instilled in me from day one and again I was so fortunate to, you know, that I could get into uh, the Jesuit high school where I had a classical liberal education, not liberal in the contemporary sense of the word, but right. for your listeners to understand what that is. And that taught me how to think and to think for myself. Now, Hemingway said that the most essential gift for a good writer is to have a built-in shockproof shit detector. <laughs> yeah, you, you so true. Uh -huh. so. What? So you, you know, you might have said it when I was off the air, but you said it would take. So you, you had this nine to five job, and then you left that. It was a stable nine to five job, and you went to, to the commercial real estate in the early '80s, and then the demands of the job kept requiring more and more of you, and you found yourself on the grip of alcoholism. And then it says in what you sent me that it would take tragedy to pull you out. What was that? And you may have well, that's the part it. that you missed. My second yeah. wife, who, as I told your listeners, was she had powers. And so she was not only wife and lover, but spiritual mentor and moral compass. She dropped dead one night. And there's, there's I said, there's nothing to prepare one for that experience. And I studied death for years after that. So I know a little bit about the subject, but that was a pivotal point in my life. And I had to overcome, not over, I had to learn what the lesson was and to get the comfort that our love survived a physical death to then move on. What, what did you learn from that? Well, I learned, you know, people, I learned people don't want to talk about death. Mm -hmm. I learned that it can mean, you know, saying goodbye to a 90 something parent yeah. who's had a great life and you've had time to tie all the loose ends together. That's that to the violent, traumatic death of a young child. Mm -hmm. And that's that. But they're, they're very different. You see, they're very different. So you, you have to see what what this kind of means. I joined, well, I, I joined a, a group called the Ernest Becker Foundation. Ernest Becker uh, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1973 for a book called The Denial of Death. And he, it was published posthumously because he died at the age of 49. You know, <laughs> you know, kind of an ironic statement. Yeah. It was one of the best secular example or discussions of why people do the things they do. And his theory was that the, the human animal is born with conscious self-awareness of themselves, of the world around them, of other people. And they're also born with the understanding that they're going to die. So this is quite a dilemma to bear, right? You know you're here. I know. And, you, and then you know you, you, you're going to be gone. And I, I thought that made a lot of sense and I think provides, again, kind of a secular explanation. So I uh, contributed to the organization. I sponsored some symposia with academics, you know, and really delved into the subject. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I some people watching may know, but I I can relate a little bit in that right after in May of 2019 or in June of 2019, I got a call from my daughter saying that her dad had cancer. And two weeks later, he was paralyzed in both arms. And five months later, he passed away. And, and, and there were some loose ends that weren't tidied up and, you know, emotions that hadn't been dealt with. And that was life changing for me, too. It made me decide, you know, gosh, life is so short and I want to create a life that I really love and I want to live each day to the fullest. And there's so much to do and so much that I want to accomplish and and learn about. And and you never know when we never know when our day is going to come. I, I, I find that people who have experienced great loss, usually meaning the death of someone very close to them. But it could be, you know, other things too, but they're not the same afterwards. No. They're, they're not the same. And there's just something you can almost tell when you first meet them. There's, they're just there, they're carrying their knowledge. Right. And, and I don't know who this is. It says a Facebook user posted that we're born to die and suppose that's part of the deal and that we, we only die once we live every day. And, you know, I knew, I knew some of those sayings, you know, like life is short and all of that. But it didn't really mean as much to me until that happened. No, because you have this uh, subconscious mechanism, uh, the denial, whatever you want to call it, that if you didn't have that, you'd kind of go crazy pretty quickly. You would. Yeah. You said that, that happens to other people, not me yeah. or whatever. So, yeah, that is really tough. And Katie says, um, I concur. Nothing prepares one for that experience. She had the opportunity to live through it, too. Yeah. So... You said that you were, so you were in the grip of alcoholism. Was that before she passed away or after? Yeah. And she gave basically, she wasn't one to proselytize. She read the Bible every night and did her own exegesis. She wasn't into the ritual much. She, you know, I, I was doing bad things and she said, you know, this is it. You either straighten up or I'm gone. And, and I did. You straightened up yeah. on your own. You yep. didn't have to get, did you go get help or, I mean, that's really hard to well, stop. We went to a counselor and he was a wise person. Uh, we were living in LA at the time and his office wasn't in Beverly Hills. It was in a house in the back of another house. And he looked like an Old Testament prophet. And he had been there, he had personal experience. And he said, you know, um, I, I, you know, I can, go through other therapy with you, but it would just be a waste of our time and your money because until you stop drinking, your head's in a fog. You can't process any. How can you process other therapies? It's pretty binary. So, but he, but he also said, you have to find out what works for you. And my dad, almost at the same age I was at the time, had heart surgery and this doctor told him, if you keep drinking, he was like a heavy, he was alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Although then that expression didn't exist. Right. You were a two-fisted drinker and that was mm -hmm. a compliment. You're cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everyone does. Yeah. And he was a two pack a day smoker. You know, mm -hmm. Dr. Sutton, unless you straighten up, uh, you may have a couple more years left. So my dad went cold turkey. It just wow. an enormous act of will. He literally never had a drink after that. But he would sit in his chair, quiet, uncommunicative. The, the Buddhists have an expression for it, feeding the hungry ghost. Mm -hmm. If you don't feed the ghost, you, you feel an emptiness. And if you can't fill it, you know, then, you know, what he did was the right thing for his, himself and his family, but it left a hole that he didn't know how to fill. Right. So I was mindful of that. And I, what I... I thought about different things and eventually adopted what I call a program of controlled moderation. I'd go for days without drinking. And then if I felt like having a beer, a glass of wine, I'd have one, maybe two, but never more than three. That's and amazing. That took, it, it, yeah. Never drinking, never driving, even if I had one drink. Mm -hmm. And then go for periods without drinking. And over time, it 
it didn't become that big deal because your brain, alcohol wires your brain to believe that if you don't drink, you're, you're going to be unhappy. So it's hard to explain to your listeners who haven't been through this, but you really believe your life is better being drunk. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of deprogram yourself. And when you do, then uh, you start thinking clearly again. Yeah. And, and I do that to this day. And a lot of people think that they can stop on their own. I mean, I think not everyone can stop like you did or, you know, just say they're going to have one. I know my son tried that every time he would have one, it got to be, you know, many. And so he just doesn't have any. In my, I've always been pretty self-directed in my life in business and my person. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to find out what works for you. Right. Do what I mean, you can read all the books uh, about, you know, the secrets and the, and the seven habits and everything. And there's a lot of good ideas, but they may not work for you on your specific issue at that right. specific point in your life. And that's what you have to figure out. Right. That's right. So I think this is Laura. She said her father has severe Parkinson's. It's challenging to see him suffer. And I'm grateful that he was there for my first breath. Maybe I can be there for his last. Yeah. That's great because in my case, I didn't have... Well, the title of, of the chapter in my book, The Devil and My Wife's Death, is called No Last Words. And having that last contact, you know, which I did with both of my other parents, it's just, it's great. It's great when you can do it. It was just, let's see. So somebody else said, my family also immigrated from Ukraine and so did my best friends. I think most Ukrainians suffer some, from some level of PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's lucky. Yeah, Lucky Tucker said, Natalie Tucker said that. Yeah. So do, do you agree with that? Or have you noticed that? I mean, if you take Ukrainian history, uh, Ukraine wasn't a separate nation state until the 20th century. It, it always was a region or under the domination of Russia or Poland. And it's just a, con a constant, you know, kind of battleground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so going back, you know, 10 centuries, I would say that's yeah, probably embedded in, in our DNA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. So your book, let's let's see, I've got a banner here that talks about your book. It's called The Other Side, oh, I should have put a capital T, but whatever, The Other Side of Success. And you say here, uh, your book is for people looking for inspiration, an inspirational story about personal success and growth people who are concerned with the state of the American dream today. And we need to talk about that. That's the title of, you know, the, this episode is the pursuit of the American dream at all costs. And then you say people thirsty to know the lessons learned from a life lived in San Francisco and LA at the epicenter of cultural change. You start to describe that in the, in the you describe that in the book. And then you said also like those trying to balance the demands of their career with their mental well-being, and I told you before this episode, I think that's everybody. <laughs> this book's for everybody, <laughs> especially nowadays. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about your book. Well, one of the the central themes is what I call skin in the game. Okay, mm -hmm. and and that applies not only to business, where I think most people associated with where you risk your time, your money, your reputation, and you've interviewed entrepreneurs and businessmen so that you have something at stake. No risk, no reward. If, if you have really nothing at stake, and, and I see success really as just serial goal setting and achievement in, in the material world. Yes. Uh, you're not going to find meaning in this world just because it's the world of time, space, and contingency. So putting skin in the game in business and in life means taking risks. And if you're wrong, it's going to cost you because that's the lesson. You're not going to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't have to have a passion for the business. I mean, it maybe helps if you do, but as a child, I didn't dream of selling you know, skyscrapers, it's necessity and putting skin in the game. 
And that's what keeps propelling you forward. There, there is no one magic formula or secret or anything. If there were, believe me, the Goldman Sachs would have put a syndicate together and bought it and monetized <laughs> it a long time ago. Yeah. And it's, it's always funny, you know, because I talk to my colleagues, you know, the, the people at the very top, you know, the billionaire the developers, property owners. It was inconceivable that they they got there because they were able to get an edge yeah. <laughs> and to to tell others what their secret was. Well, it was like inconceivable. It's like, why would I do that? Mm -hmm. Why would I create more competition for myself? It never made sense, you see, mm -hmm. in the real in that real world. So but so skin in the game. The other thing is how do you find meaning? Because you can as we well know, you can become very successful, very wealthy, and still be an asshole, mm -hmm. or do bad things, mm -hmm. okay. or, or be do it at the cost of your family life, or yeah. whatever. Okay, so how do you find meaning? And this, I'm just starting work on my second book, and it doesn't have a title or anything, but it's it's in this whole area, you know how. How can you be successful and for lack of a better word, happy? <laughs> right. Although I don't believe that happiness is an end product. I think it's a transitory occasional state of a life well lived. Right. And, and so yeah, my I belief mean, is joyful most of the time, right? Yeah. Oh, I hear a little echo, but yeah. Okay. So my my belief is before. that we, we tend to process information in kind of a binary fashion left brain, right brain, whatever, even though it's one head. And, and so I divide it into the world of the scene. This is the material world of time, space, and contingency, where you can achieve success, which I define as achieving tangible, measurable goals. Because if they're not measurable or tangible, you have no way of knowing whether you improved or not. Okay, be it, be, it, be it a financial statement, a job title, anything. Okay. Uh, or if you're a rabbi, you, you know, it's the size of your congregation and a bunch of other things in that world. And that's just, that's the way I see them. So you have to find meaning in the world of the unseen. And this includes religion and spirituality and metaphysics. And to... In, in the work I do with people, I, I ask them in this world, I ask them just two questions. One, what do you believe to be true? Okay, what do you believe to be true? And I mean this in, in the overall top-down sense, starting with, if you believe that life starts at zero and ends at zero, that's fine, I don't care, but you're gonna live your life in a certain way and you're going to achieve that alignment or that harmony uh, by being true to yourself, where your efforts in the material world are aligned with your thinking in the spiritual world, okay? If you don't believe that life starts at zero and ends at zero, then what do you believe exactly, okay? Do you believe in a personal God? Do you believe in the next life? Do you believe in the power of prayer? That's fine, okay. Then how do you align that with what you do in, in again, in the, the material world? And these are, th these are not complicated questions, but then the whole question, what do you believe to be true, percolates down to the images that you're, fixated on, on your handheld gadget every day, the video and audio images. You know, do you believe that that is true? Okay. If you do, then there's, I can't give you much help. <laughs> I mean, frankly, you see, mm -hmm. and then what are you going to do about it? You know, if you have a religious bent, are you going to practice it or just talk about it? You know, if you have a bent for, are, are you going to speak up or you have the personal courage to speak up, you know, when you're 
kid comes home from school and tells you what he or she has been taught, and you say that's just not factually true, and then they start crying. Well, what are you going to do about that? Okay, so that's what do you believe to be true? The other question is whom do you admire? Okay, you tell me the people living or dead close to you or, you know, historic celebrities or whatever, who do you admire? And that kind of tells me uh, what your current trajectory is. So that's as far as I've gotten right now in my next book. <laughs> it sounds like, I hear an echo, I don't know why, but it seems like your wife, your second wife really influenced, had a big influence on you. Yeah, and you, you may have missed the part when you got cut out, but after she after she dropped dead, yeah, I went to see a grief counselor. Well, at first I thought about just pulling the plug. You know, you start, you know, what's the point, right? When that happens, like what's the point of anything, right? And what is the point? But then it was through the help of a psychic medium who both of us had known for years. And I'm not here to you know, convince your listeners of the authenticity of that whole subject. But believe me, I was a hardened skeptic. You know, I dealt with, negotiated with people whose names you read in the paper. And these are masters of illusion. <laughs> so, and I studied like everything else. And I, I came to the conclusion that there's just a handful of people. Uh, it's primarily either people who don't have skills or a fraudulent enterprise, but there's a tiny percentage who can access valuable information in ways I can't explain. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I don't need to explain it if it works. Then yeah. it goes into my tool bag. So she, we, she was able to reconnect me with my wife. Awesome. And as I told you, listeners, uh, I discovered that love can survive physical death. And at that time, I was ready to move on. That's awesome. I did reach out to, I don't know why I have an echo. Do you hear an echo? No, I'm fine at my end. Okay. Yeah, I did reach out to somebody and I've been in connect, I've connected with my former husband who passed away. So I believe in that. I believe that there's people, there are people that can do that. Yeah. I, but so the pursuit of the American dream at all costs. And you, you said too, that, you know, there's people clearly that are concerned about the state of the American dream today and how it got to where it is. You want to talk about that? Yes. And it's refreshing to have you want to talk about it because I've talked to show hosts and there are a lot of people who are afraid to talk about things. Well, I <laughs> in, guess in it's this day and age. Also. Uh, you get doxxed, you lose, you lose your listeners, you're finished. So the fact that you even want to go there is. <laughs> well, I think it depends on, you know, I mean, everybody has an opinion on what the American dream is. I'm interested in knowing your opinion. It doesn't mean that I'm going to agree or disagree. You know, I started this, this Facebook group and I would love for it, for it to be more than a Facebook group, but it's called the Onward Movement. And we have a manifesto and some of the thing, one of the things in the manifesto is we see you, we hear you, you know, and I've had, there's been times when people in that Facebook group make a comment or something that somebody disagrees with. And we just try to have a conversation about it and not get into fighting like you see a lot on Facebook. So yeah, I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. It doesn't mean that I'm going to agree with it. Everyone has their own idea of what the American dream is, but I'd love to hear what you have to say. Well, to me, it always meant that you're given an opportunity, okay? You're not promised an outcome, but you're given an opportunity that if you work hard, maintain certain values, and with a little bit of luck, you can succeed in your own way at, the, at, at your point in time, mm -hmm. okay? The, 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 whatever, whatever you wanna call what's happening today, 
let's call it the cultural revolution, mm -hmm. okay? Where things are, are, in my mind, as I talk to more and more people in different areas and see what's being promulgated. And a lot of people uh, don't know what's even being promulgated. Like here in California, in not just the universities, but in high schools, and in grade schools with curriculum, if if they just knew, they would they would they would just be shocked. So part of it is the not knowing. Do and you want to give an it, example? So I mean, do you want to be specific and give an example so we know exactly what you're talking about? Well, in California, uh, they just recently passed AB 101, which which mandates the the study or it, it mandates that any person in high school will take an ethnic studies course and that they they can't graduate or if they, or if they and, and get into a college because the colleges are now saying that's a prerequisite for admission. Okay, and, and so then there's a curriculum that's developed and that's disseminated to all the school districts and then to all the teachers. And the, the, the push is an active, so what I would call it neo-Marxist or neo-collectivist agenda, where even math is considered uh, subject to the scrutiny of a critical lens, which means that even factual truth is considered a social construct. And this leads to not having any academic requirements as this is happening in the state of Oregon. They, you don't need to have any basic uh, proficiency in math or reading or anything else to graduate from high school. But it's an, an, it's an indoctrination of children. <laughs> And, yeah, I don't know enough to, to 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 go back and forth, you know, on each point. But the thing is, is that there's so much regarding ethnicity that hasn't been taught for a long time in our schools at all. Yeah, in, in my my perspective, I was married three times. My my first wife was Native American. We divorced. My second wife was African American, and my present wife is African American. I have multiracial children. I have stepchildren of different races, friends. My business life, I dealt with clients from all over the world. I had mentors who were Asian. So I, I have a different perspective on this yeah. than what you see on the images. And what, they, what the people who manufacture the images try to have you believe is true with regard to <laughs> what people are like, irrespective of skin color, you know, but race has become a vehicle. It's, it's, and, you know, I know the Soviet playbook and my, my parents taught me that. And what's happening is, is or Orwellian and it's, it's, it's tragic. And I'm, I'm trying to stay calm, but mm -hmm. I can give you other examples of things beyond the pale that you could even two years ago not believe could really be happening. So this cuts to the heart of the American dream and I guess we'll see what happens. Well, yeah. And I think the main thing is for everybody to be aware and try to get to the truth and to speak up and not let, you know, to make sure that their vote is heard and to speak up and to not let others speak for them and that we need to educate ourselves on this, not necessarily believe everything that's on all the different stations, because that's just what somebody else is telling us. And that, you know, but how do you get to that truth? It takes a lot of time. It takes well, a lot. That's, of time that's the problem. <laughs> my, my daughter, she's she runs the Native American Health Center, which are clinics in the Bay Area. And with COVID, she's on the front line. My son-in-law, he's a social worker. They don't have the time. Right. <laughs> as most people don't. And they met an ethnic studies class at Cal Berkeley. But what ethnic studies, quote, means today is fundamentally opposite of what it meant, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And, and, and so one of it is finding the time. And most people with families and kids, 
and both uh, parents working don't have it, the time to really, you, you have to read books, you have to do things, you have to examine, you know, the legislation, you, you'd be able to talk intelligently about any of these things. So that's part of it. But the other part is, I believe human beings are inherently decent, most people, okay? And they have good intuition, but they can also be easily swayed. And in a lot of these situations, you know, irrespective of political or educational or financial, wherever you deal with this, they, they kind of know. They know inside, but they're afraid to say anything. Mm. And if there's one thing on most of the podcasts I've done the last couple of months, it, it always comes up that, yeah, you know, we're just, we know they're afraid to, because they can lose their job, right? They may have to homeschool the kids or whatever. Lose their job. They're afraid yeah. and, and oh, they're... they're afraid to speak up. And this is, uh, when that happens, this is like Berlin in 1934 or Soviet Russia in 1921. I mean, this isn't anything new. When you're afraid to speak up, even to discuss a topic for fear of being labeled something, and can't even it's talk like, it about it. Like, that's that's a sad state of affairs. Uh huh. But it seems like there can't. It's very hard to have any discussion because it just gets into an argument, and it's maybe a post on Facebook, and someone makes a comment, someone else makes a comment, and then no one is trying. I mean, I'm speaking in general terms, but I don't see a lot of people trying to understand other points of view. I don't well, see a lot of that or having a discussion because I don't. I don't. Based on what you're saying, I don't think I necessarily agree with everything you're saying, but I haven't gone and read the curriculum for, you know, in that California law and, you know, all of that. So there's a lot of work that has to happen, like we just talked about, to really understand the issues. And I think we have a lot of people talking about the issues that don't completely understand them. To one of the people that provided a praise quote for my book, is a friend, a really smart guy. He runs an organization called Common Good. And he's in, you know, lobbies in DC for uh, bipartisan support of just improve, you know, weeding the bureaucracy, you know, building infrastructure, doing things that really help people. And he just fights a terrific battle every day. He said, to have a discussion, you need two things. He, he's, you need one, agreement on what is factually true, on whatever the point is. And that gets back to my kind of precept, you know, what do you believe? But if you believe there is that fact, that there is, that you can't agree that anything is factually true, that it's all relative or subject to some interpretation in the eyes of the beholder, well, you can't have a discussion. The other thing you need is someone who respects you and you respect them to the degree that you can have a civil discourse. Right. If you don't have those two things, there is no discussion to be had. And we don't have a lot of that. Yeah. That so I to, I, I find like in all these issues, is the first decision is, am I talking to someone who is willing to talk or is uncommitted on an issue or has a position, but is interested in hearing mine and I'm interested in hearing his or hers. But if the person opposite you is an ideologue and there is no discussion, then you have to do other things, you know, and people are starting to finally do them, whether, whether it's litigation or, or organizing themselves and, you know, and it's starting to happen. Well, in some ways, it's starting to happen in violent ways, which doesn't solve anything. Uh, th that's th that's not what I'm referring to. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to organizations of people from from different political backgrounds. Mm -hmm. if, if you want to divide them that way, conservative, liberal, mm -hmm. uh, th that just say this this is a it's a nonpartisan issue. If, yeah. if this is patently false, okay, 
It's just not true. And it's being promulgated as true, then we're going to fight it. And these organizations, a lot of them are so-called self-identified liberals. I'm not talking about people rioting. I'm talking about legitimate organizations that are just trying to, you know, have people understand what's what's really happening. So what would you say to the Onward podcast listeners about how they can, you know, do what they can at their level? You know, somebody might say, well, I'm not an elected official. I'm not in a leadership position. I'm not, you know, I'm just me and I can't do anything. What would you say? Well, you at some point you have to cut out some time, make some time in your day, you know, maybe half hour at night after the kids go to bed or whatever. You have to carve out some time to really try to educate yourself on an issue that may be central to you, okay, or, or to your family or, or to your life. And, you know, without that, the only other thing you can do is, again, who do you admire? You, you find a person, maybe a family member, it can be a friend, it can be somebody else who you know enough about and see how they respond that you say, well, you know, I don't agree with everything he or she says, but maybe 80 or 90% of the time I do. And what is their position on this issue? So you, you can take an informed stance, okay? What is their position? As long as that person has, is informed and not just, you know, like, you know, hasn't done their well, research. If, if you're going to wait for somebody to enlighten you, then it ain't going to happen. Well, That's I think what I'm well, saying. I can... it, takes, it takes some commitment of time to educate. And you can Google on the internet and get a lot of at least preliminary information, almost anything. So it's never been easier from that standpoint. But it takes time and thought, and you have to reflect on it, Okay. Reflect yeah. on it, I think also talk to somebody that might have a different point of view because there might be something you're missing about that. Exactly. About that. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it's but it's not it's not it's not a political stance. It's not how you vote. I'm talking about how culture is embedded with you know, and this isn't accidental. This isn't the spontaneous action of people mobilizing themselves. This has been going on for 50 years, okay, 50 years. You follow, you know, the, 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 in the universities and the tenured professors and all the, the papers and all of that. This isn't advocating for a political position. It's just, you know, if... If this if this is patently false, I can't believe it. No matter if I'm a liberal or conservative, and and what can the average person do? Well, when they educate themselves, whatever position they take, uh, maybe they agree that you know the, the problem is that this is a this is a terrible country, and the the institutions of the country need to be destroyed, so as to rebuild it. Okay. Well, then that's what you believe, okay? But if you don't believe that, then what do you believe? And then it starts one person at a time. You talk to your friend across at the end of the block, or you talk with one of the parents where your kid goes to school, and they see you're not afraid, and it may bring them out, you see? Mm -hmm. And you do it in your own life one person at a time. Laura said, let's see, she said, some people who become teachers, she used to be a teacher, are a bit arrogant and have a desire for power. And sometimes in college, the professors become cult-like leaders. I had an ultra-liberal professor. I was fairly liberal, but my I still warn my children about having teachers and professors like that. Do you want to comment on that, or is that is she getting to the yeah, point? Yeah, that, that must have been years ago because today it's 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 all pervasive, and most people don't realize even in the last three years how things have changed. And I, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, I'm an old guy now, 
but but I have the perspective of history. And I lived in California and yeah, I saw what happened here and for for good and for not so good. So give one more, as we wrap it up, give one more example about what you're talking about. The, there, there, is, there is a concerted desire, and this is reflected largely by the images you see and don't see on the media, social media, traditional media, of an organized effort to really undermine the basic institutions of this country. And you, you can't have an American dream if you don't have an America. And, and I'm not afraid to speak about it. And again, I've had experiences that other, others haven't had or with race, with religion, where with parents who lived under regimes where the actual verbiage and terminology are identical from the Soviet playbook. So, like what? What? What's the? Word? Well, you see, you see these convoluted discussions of you know, hege hege hegemonic, you know, patriarchal or rule or these words that you don't know what they mean. Okay, mm -hmm. even the word equity. Okay, I know what equity means in a business sense. It's you know the value of an asset minus the debt. What you have left is equity. Well, what does it mean in the social sense? And how is it different from equality? You know? And if if you can't explain it, okay, then what's your end game? Okay, how do whatever you believe it to be, how do you implement it? And what's it gonna look like in a year or two or three? You see? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. What tip quick tips do you have about sales? Because this is <laughs> broadcast on LinkedIn, and some people watching here, you know, are probably you know have companies do sales. You know, what is it that you learned? Because you've sold, you know, from from brushes, fuller brushes, up to commercial buildings, and you said it's all a lot of it's the same. Well, Liz, I just like to interject that I love to hear from listeners and readers, and if they go to my website, if they scroll all the way to the bottom they can send me an email. Yeah. And if they have questions, I'd be happy to, you know, on a case specific basis to render them. But what, again, what I learned in sales was that you're selling four brushes and it's the most fundamental, like mano a mano. You, you go up to a door and you ring the bell. And at that time, most women, there weren't as many women in the workforce. So you'd be dealing with a lower to middle class housewife, okay, mm -hmm. who doesn't, doesn't want to speak to you. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> All right. So there's rejection. I mean, it, it is, I, I have a whole chapter in the book. It's kind of funny, you know, but so if you if you can't deal with rejection, then you, you don't understand sales. And sales are different today because a lot of it is virtual. You, you never get to physically meet the person. And your communication may be through emails. So you don't get the benefit of the spontaneous being able to assess them, right? You right. just get some edited, ed edited comments that probably went through corporate. So, but where you have an opportunity for, you know, mano a mano sales. The second thing is to develop, you have to develop trust. And again, selling door to door it's not like you have weeks or months, right? You, or you're dealing with, you know, upper management and, you know, state pension fund, for example, like, you know, clients I had in commercial real estate, but you either, they like you or they're going to let you in the house. And you have two, one to two minutes to establish trust. If you don't, then they're going to throw you out or they'll just kind of sit and look at you and you know they're not going to buy anything and they're just wasting your time. Okay. The third is you have to do something proactively for them to distinguish yourself. If you just come in and ask for an order, why, why would they give it to you? Right. And then I got this all from my mentors. So I would go in selling household products. I'd roll my sleeves. I I'd pull out the furniture polish and shine their, their coffee table and I'd go in the bathroom 
got the toilet bowl cleaner. I cleaned the toilet bowl out. I I do whatever I had to do. Okay. Then, then I could ask for the order. Okay. The fourth thing is when you're asking for the order, you have to sense the level of desire. Okay. My my mentor, the, the first night before I even went out on a call with him, he gave me the four brush catalog. It was beautiful. You know, probably 40 pages, you know, four color print. He said in at the buy at, at, under each item, there would be a description and then suggested retail price. Okay. So he said, go home and he raised all the prices. <laughs> His name was Irv. I said, Irv, how, how will I know what to ask? He said, see how bad they like it. See how much they want it. And I learned that pricing was elastic, fluid. <laughs> it's whatever is that negotiated middle ground between a buyer and a seller. You, you yeah. see how fundamental this is? Yeah, it is. And yeah. then the last and the most important was the, the way this worked, I would take orders and then the, the forward brush company, because I was basically an independent contractor working for myself, would send me the products on credit, okay? And then I would go deliver them. And after the people paid, okay, then I'd send it back to the company. Then they'd send me my cut for the commission, okay? So I'd go back and the housewife, this is like a week later, maybe two weeks later. Look, I, you know, I talked to my husband. He said, we really don't need that. And, you know, uh -oh. and again, I, I was going through these things where I, I made, quote, made the sale, but I didn't, I couldn't collect. And Irv really dressed me down. He said, we're not in the business of selling. We're in the business of selling and collecting. <laughs> okay. And just to show you how smart Irv was, you know, he, he, he drove an Eldorado and whatnot. And when he made his calls, you know, custom suit, manicured. You know. But when it came time to collect, he, he had some older guy who he paid, who just kind of went there and nobody could argue with him. He said, you know, I, I, I don't know anything. I'm just, I, I need to get your money, you see. And in those occasions where the guy would be sick with something and Irv had to go do it, he didn't go in the suit in the, in the El Dorado. He, he dressed down with J.C. Penny garb. He took his son and kind of made him look like a waif to induce more sympathy. And he drove a rusted old car to the house and kind of came up and they didn't have the heart to cancel the order. You, you see, you don't learn these things in school. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> so there you have six principles. Does that do it? That does it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was awesome. So I um, will, when I publish the episode, I will put all of your social media. You, there's your Instagram and your Facebook and a link to buy your book. And I really enjoyed having you on the podcast today, Martin, tonight. And i um, so glad that it happened that you were able to keep talking even though I was off with the thunderstorms but yeah I mean if you want to edit parts out if it gets a little too heavy that's but I, I am what I am I and I yeah. say what I say so it's... oh so someone said you sold me on reading your book ha. <laughs> <laughs> you sold the book tonight <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show I really oh, I really enjoyed it is this what you expected or yeah, this is, how, this is how my shows usually go, except for uh, I don't always have a thunderstorm thing, but <laughs> yes. So thank you very much. I'll be right okay. back. Thanks so much, Emily. Really All enjoyed it. Right. Thank you for everybody who watched tonight. I really appreciate it. And for joining in on the conversation, I appreciate you. Yeah. So I just want to play a quick outro that I have, and then we'll end the show. And I'm live here every night, Wednesday night at 730. So join us. I always have some an awesome guest on and it's so fun. I love doing this podcast. The Onward Podcast is sponsored by Emily Harmon Coaching and Consulting. Visit my website, emilyharmon.com to learn more about my coaching programs and how you can work with me. Let's move onward together.